I'm Dr. Janet Cummings, president of the Nicholas and Dorothy Cummings Foundation and Cummings Foundation for Behavioral Health, and also co-founder of the Cummings Graduate Institute for Behavioral Health Studies. This keynote is titled, The History of Psychotherapy in America, 1943 through 2016, The Golden Era, Faltering Past and Stalled Present. It was delivered at the National Association of Professional Psychology Providers, or NAPPP, at its convention in San Antonio on September 23, 2016, by Dr. Nicholas A. Cummings. A former APA president, not only has my father lived the history of psychology, but he's also been one of the major participants who anticipated every phase of the 70-year rise and fall of psychotherapy in America. Psychotherapy as we know it today had its unexpected beginnings during World War II. Before 1943, in the entire United States, there were about 400 psychotherapists in private practice, over 90% of whom were women with master's degrees who were seeing children. There were five exceptions, all women with PhDs, but also who were seeing children concurrent with their families. Two of these were the well-known Nancy Bailey in California and Florence Mateer in Ohio. The latter was the first psychologist to appear in court on behalf of a patient. This was in 1928, and since there were no recognized credentials for the private practice of psychology, the judge asked Dr. Mateer what qualified a psychologist like her to testify in court. In a manner befitting this feisty woman, she cocked her head back and snidely replied, First of all, your honor, intelligence. The judge was taken aback, but he quickly replied, the court recognizes Dr. Mateer as a qualified expert witness. This was the very first time a psychologist was an expert witness. Before 1943, the U.S. Department, uh, War Department recognized only two types of medical practitioners medicine, and surgery. The newly appointed Brigadier General Walter Menninger, brother of the famous Carl Menninger, both of the celebrated Menninger Clinic of Topeka, Topeka, Kansas, added a third, psychiatry. He also drafted into service master's level male psychologists who were teachers, put them through a 90-day crash course in treatment, and then sent them to the front line to immediately treat so-called battle neuroses as they first occurred. These early interventions were remarkably successful in preventing full-blown mental breakdowns, and the U.S. Army then made clinical psychologists a permanent part of the medical corps with officer commissions. Paratrooper divisions were a new type of military unit first created in World War II. Effective as paratroopers were, they suffered a very high casualty rate in their fourth jump from what was called jump door fever. These very brave troopers faced incredible danger and a high casualty rate with every jump. But belief in an absurd myth enabled them to face this grave danger. The life of a paratrooper averaged three jumps, even though some were killed in the first, second, or fourth or fifth jumps. Superstition, however, said that one is not killed until after the third jump. And as absurd as this belief was, it enabled paratroopers to face the danger. But if they survived, they would face the fourth jump with the belief that their time was up. As a result, they would go into a panic state and freeze at the jump door. After counting to 10, the jump sergeant would put his boot in the trooper's back, pushing him out. Invariably, the trooper would black out, forget all of his training, and be killed by the enemy within seconds. Thus were 
of paratrooper casualties on the fourth jump. This prompted General Menninger to appoint famous psychoanalyst Dr. Frieda Frome Reichmann, MD, to design a way for paratroop officers to talk the panic trooper seemingly out the door in 10 seconds. I was one such officer selected to go to the 60-day program in New York, and after this training, I never lost another paratrooper to jump door fever. If a 10-second psychological intervention could do all of that, I decided that if I survived the war, I wanted to become a psychologist. To say I was subsequently disappointed when I found out in graduate school that all psychotherapy at the time was academic and long-term and skewed by, and it would be skewed by stating it politely, I never spent a lifetime developing brief psychotherapy just to pass or pass traditional modes. The beginning of clinical psychology Sort of. Shortly after World War II, the Veterans Administration began funding universities that agreed to form clinical psychology doctoral programs. And this was soon followed by the newly created National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH. University psychology departments could not resist this largesse, and they seemingly overnight established clinical psychology programs that were shameful shams, intended only to gra grab the windfall to enlarge their experimental programs. Token clinical courses that were such in name only were established and taught by academic professors who were mostly hostile to clinical psychology. I recall my appointment with a very likable and famous Professor Edward Tolman at the University of California in Berkeley. When I stated I did not decide to become a psychologist just to run rats, he genuinely smiled and amicably said, oh, you want to peck pigeons, as he wrote a note to put me in touch with Skinnerian programs at other universities. But we pioneers did not survive the Great War just to be stymied by entrenched academia. We surreptitiously made arrangements for clinical training with friendly psychiatrists whom we paid to hold regular clandestine classes evenings in their homes. In that era, psychotherapy was always preceded by a battery of psychological tests, typically the Wexler Bellevue Intelligence Scale, the Rorschach, the Thematic Apperception Test, or TAT, the Bender Gestalt, and the Macover Draw Person. We began providing psychological testing for our teachers' clients for our evening classes, and soon testing requests burgeoned to the point we were being paid to deliver them. The demand for psychotherapy also far exceeded the number of psychiatrists in post the post-war era and soon we were providing psychotherapy to our mentors' patient overflows, all under their supervision and without the knowledge of our professors who, had they known, would have promptly dismissed us. Yes, we who comprised the first era of clinically trained psychology and soon established the first wave of publicly practicing psychologists literally bootlegged our training in an era long before licensure. Although we thus pulled it off, practicing psychologists for the next 50 years were hampered and harassed by the academically dominated APA, which fought our efforts toward licensure, third party payment, and societal acceptance. This gave rise to the Dirty Dozen. It has long been forgotten that the practice of medicine began its training as an apprenticeship and continued so as recently as the 1920s. Medical schools were irrelevant and mostly non-existent. 
and young men and occasionally a very rare young woman served as helpers for a practicing physician until such time as the physician began to retire, turning over more and more of his practice to the former apprentice. This was how physicians were trained as far back as Galen and Herodotus in ancient Greece. Medical licensure did not exist in the United States until the early 1930s, and the last pre-licensure physician did not retire from practice until the late 1970s, almost 1980. Once medical schools were established, other health professions followed suit very soon after, establishing their own freedom from academia. Among them were counseling, nursing, podiatric medicine, and social work, leaving clinical psychology to be the glaring exception. Practicing psychology remained in the academically dominated APA, and it has paid a very heavy price for this blunder. All the academicians were elected to the APA Board of Directors for the next 30 years, rendering practicing psychology which soon comprised the majority of the APA membership, a very unhappy stepchild. <clears throat> Having no voice in the national organization, <clears throat> in the late 1950s, practicing psychologists began forming the first local and then state associations. Among the first were the New York State Psychological Association, or NISPA, and the California State Psychological Association. CSPA, and later just CPA. The last state association to be established was in Missouri in 1978. <clears throat> Although state associations were practitioner-driven, they were largely not militant organizations. That gave rise to the Dirty Dozen, 14 activists who were accused of not being able to count. Led by the fearless Rogers Wright, they conducted a 30-year war on academic psychology and in the process elected several practitioners as APA presidents, the first being Theodore Blau and the second Dirty Dozen member Nicholas Cummings, followed by several other Dirty Dozen members. Constantly doing battle after battle with the academically dominated APA, Many a remarkable fight was won and others lost, and one typical example must suffice. In 1965, Medicare and Medicaid were created by the Congress, and Health Care Secretary Joseph Califano held a series of hearings with each of the health professions to determine their role and participation in the new Medicaid-Medicare system. He was interested in widespread participation and was dismayed with the APA's not having at all responded to his invitation. Learning of this on a Wednesday, Rogers Wright called Secretary Califano and learned that the hearings closed at noon the following Monday. Roger and I were grateful to be granted a meeting with him for Friday and canceling all of our appointments, we caught flights to Washington, D.C. the following day. Grateful for our appearance, Secretary Califano said he would accept our proposal filed officially by the APA, but the deadline was noon the following Monday. Fortunately, the APA Board of Directors was meeting that Saturday and Sunday, and we petitioned APA President Jerome Bruner for allowing us 15 minutes to present our case. All day Saturday and most of Sunday, we were denied. Finally, President-elect Nicholas Hobbs met with us in the lobby and he immediately grasped the need for an APA filing. Prevailing upon Bruner, we were granted 20 minutes, which went to almost an hour, ending with an understanding of the APA's importance of filing. It was determined that I would draft the proposal on Sunday night, have it on the APA's desk early Monday morning, and a messenger after he signed it would deliver it to the Secretary Califano's office hours before the deadline.
I stayed up all night not only drafting the letter, but also typing it with my one finger in experience. At 8 a.m., it was at the APA, and satisfied with a job well done, I caught a late morning flight back to San Francisco. Six months later, I received a call, phone call from Jerry Bruner, secretary at Harvard, saying she had a letter addressed to healthcare secretary Califano, and what did I want her to do with it? The filing date had long passed. With shock, I realized psychology had thereby been excluded from Medicare participation. It was exactly 30 years later that on behalf of the APA, I appeared with APA practice director Bryant Welsh before a Congressional Medicare Reform Committee hearing in which finally psychology was granted Medicare participation, but on a much lower level than would have been three decades ago. In the eyes of the American public, the 1950s and the early 1960s might well be regarded as psychotherapy's golden era. Thanks to the stellar performance of frontline psychologists during World War II, the American public regarded psychotherapy as the future, ultimately solving society's problems. For 10 straight years, a national poll of young women named psychologists as, quote, the man I wish to marry, unquote. As were other of my colleagues, every week I was invited to do one or even two radio and TV interviews. Several of my five-minute tape radio interviews were repeatedly broadcast internationally, and I received listeners letters from such varied places as Ireland, Greece, and South Africa. With the public's continued fascination with psychology's gimmicks, such as the visual, is this two faces or a vase, and Dr. Alan Gardner's raising chimpanzees as if they were human children, our profession was elevated to national fascination. The public was unaware that psychology was fractionated with a plethora of treatment variations. Consider, for example, this array of therapies. Freudian, Neo-Freudian, Jungian, Adlerian, Kleinian, Ericksonian, Behavioral, Cognitive Behavioral, Interpersonal, Transactional, and humanistic, not to mention the popular Albert Ellis and his own irreverent and sex-laden brand which greatly titillated our colleagues wherever he presented. At the same time, psychologists began the process of doing themselves in. Thomas Saws in the United States and Isaac in England extensively published articles alleging that psychotherapy doesn't work and Schofield declared it is merely paid friendship. The psychology literature was littered with articles reflecting a bitter, self-destructive argument between academically oriented psychotherapists who espoused cognitive therapy and were never in private practice, and practitioners who almost overwhelmingly were psychodynamically oriented. Professor Kenneth Clark extensively wrote articles purporting that psychotherapy is not scientifically validated. And when he became APA president in 1971, he used the power of his office to prevent the recognition and success of practicing psychotherapists. So-called academic psychotherapists on various university faculties eschewed all of these practitioner modalities as they espoused and taught their own brand of cognition. This was also the mode of treatment in university counseling centers. While these academics openly opposed the independent practice of psychology. Forgotten in all of this infighting is the fact that Access I and Access II cannot be treated with the same kind of uncovering therapy that is so effective with Access I patients. Acting out Access II patients go into so-called treatment, 
whenever they are in some kind of legal, financial, scholastic, or personal trouble. They overwhelm the system with their demands, aggressively squeezing out Access One patients and overwhelming our treatment centers. As soon as they are out of trouble, they abruptly drop therapy only to demand it again with the next round of trouble. It soon was recognized by the Dirty Dozen that their effort to influence the academic, scientific, APA governance would never succeed. Accordingly, they decided to do what was regarded as impossible, gain control of the APA. Through Dirty Dozen leadership, practitioner-dominated state associations were formed and energized, and soon they became, began to dominate the APA Council of Representatives and then in the electoral system itself. Ted Blau was the first practitioner to be elected APA president, soon to be followed by Nick Cummings and a long succession of practitioners. In response, academic, scientific psychologists bolted the APA and formed their own separate organization. In the midst of all this fierce struggle between practice and academia came the Vietnam War with its unprecedented resistance among the populace and especially among young men of conscription or draft age. This gave rise to the so-called hippie era. Led by one stodgy Harvard academic, Timothy Leary, and his tune-in, turn-on, and drop-out slogan, taking LSD and smoking marijuana became popular. Therapists conducted sessions while the patient was thus intoxicated, and numerous therapists were likewise smoking pot, also known as grass, during the session. Young male psychologists grew long hair and beards as they dressed in outlandish hippie clothes, while the women were, wore full-length gingham dresses and grew long straight hair, parted in the center. Getting stoned became fashionable. At hippie resorts, such as the prototype Esalen, just south of Carmel, California. Psychologists spent long hours in hot tubs listening to others' outlandish self-revelations while awaiting their turn to do the same. When the hippie era crashed to a sudden end in 1980, the American public had had enough of this nonsense. Psychotherapy had become a laughing stock in the eyes of the public and it has never recovered its previous stature in the eyes of most Americans. The abrupt rise of managed care and the decline of psychology. The clinical psychology leadership, such as Rogers Wright and Brian Welsh, were so convinced that the prosperous psychotherapy era of the 1970s would go on forever, they failed to heed the warning that became obvious in 1980. As if someone had pulled the plug, the hippie era came to an unprecedented halt as it was overtaken by sudden and overwhelming economic and social conservatism. Along with this sea change, Americans scoffed at our outlandish psychodynamics and psychotherapies as they espoused the era of psychotropic treatment. Thus, psychology declined while medication psychiatry prospered. As a way of controlling healthcare costs, managed care rapidly took over healthcare delivery. The problem was that no one knew how to financially manage mental health except Cummings, who founded American Biodyne. He saw this as the way psychotherapy and psychology could circumvent the rapid decline while at the same time controlling costs far better than rationing. In the early 1980s, he founded American Biodyne, limiting it to 500,000 enrollees, and he invited psychologists to come and learn how to create the next 50 healthcare companies. Thus, psychology could continue to prosper. But the APA practice directorate scoffed at the idea saying Nick has really gone crazy this time. So no one came to learn. In 
Cummings took his foot off the brake, and American Biodyne grew to 25 million enrollees with 10,000 psychotherapists in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Foreseeing the rise of government-owned and sponsored mental health, he sold the company in 1995. Through a series of iterations, it became Magellan Health, one of the five giants controlling over 90% of healthcare today. While several companies form managed care organizations, only three groups of psychologists form managed healthcare companies, and all were soon acquired by American Biodyne. The Nixon administration accorded startup funds for such companies, and dozens were launched only to go bankrupt as soon as the federal startup support ran out. The problem was that they all used traditional treatment modalities, whereas American Biodyne had developed through years of delivery, then research, then more delivery, then even more delivery and research ad infinitum, the way to do it. The Biodyne model saved money by effective treatment, not by restricting health care, for it guaranteed unlimited psychotherapy as well as unlimited mental hospitalization. Finally, mental health becomes part of health care. It was not until 2010 that under the leadership and proclamation of APA President James Bray, psychology acknowledged that psychotherapy is an integral and indispensable part of healthcare. This was fully 50 years after Nick Cummings not only so advocated, but instituted this as part of the Kaiser Permanente Health System in 1959 and later in the freestanding American Biodyne founded. Much earlier, psychotherapist members of medical psychology and the National Association of Professional Psychology Providers, or NAPPP, both not only so advocated, but reflected this in their own practices. But practitioners in these organizations remained part of the PhD PsyD training within the APA, while a new Doctor of Behavioral Health program or DBH degree, was created at the huge Arizona State University in Phoenix in 2007. In 2015, the program was pulled out of ASU when the Independent Cummings Graduate Institute, or CGI, was created, making the DBH program free of traditional academic incursion. Mental health in 2016. Today, it is not an exaggeration to say that mental health care is a mess. Consider the following. A, the American Psychological Association is in turmoil as it faces an organizational crisis, as well as a series of lawsuits. There has been a decline in membership, and even more importantly, an erosion of prestige. B, medication has by far become prim a primary way to treat emotional and mental problems. And when a patient is referred for psychotherapy or counseling, it is secondary to medication. C, but for few exceptions, all emotional problems are treated with medication. If at some point the patient is referred for psychotherapy, it is invariably along with the continued meds. D, master's level counselors, of which there are now over 600,000, have taken over the field, and they are largely under the aegis of psychiatrists who have hardly any psychotherapy training. E, doctoral psychologists are now mostly in administrative or academic positions where they personally see very few, if any, patients. Yet they teach psychotherapy and they supervise it. Almost exclusively today, psychotherapy is cognitive, resulting in limited effectiveness, especially with borderline patients who are untreatable by this method and who have largely crowded out patients who could really benefit from it. 
Fortunately, there are exceptions. Largely, medical psychologists and members of the NAPPP. But this barely numbers 10,000, while there are well over 100,000 licensed psychologists and 600,000 master's level therapists and counselors. This is clearly the era of prescribing physicians, along with the domination of mental health by psychiatry. There is a movement in psychology to acquire prescription authority, and it has succeeded in a small number of states. But these unfortunately place prescribing psycho psychologists short of full privileges as are enjoyed by physicians. State associations have reconciled themselves to this limitation, whereas the NAPPP led by Dr. John Cacciavalli is insisting that future legislation must accord psychologists full prescribing privileges. In the meantime, psychotherapy is largely performed by poorly trained master's level practitioners with stringent restrictions as to when this could take place and for a prescribed number of sessions. There are a number of practicing doctoral psychologists who remain independent of any prepayment system. Their patients are those who can pay out of pocket, who many then seek partial reimbursement from the health system. The past several years has seen a sizable growth in the provision of health care, but at a considerable cost. Healthcare systems are predicting a range of 40% to 60% increase in costs beginning in 2017. The future of health care remains uncertain depending upon who controls the Congress and who occupies the White House. There's an old saying that one learns from their mistakes. If this is true, then psychology and the APA are about to have a tremendous learning experience.